Uh, Brother Devin, I'll be uh, I'll be there in a second. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you would, open your Bibles to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Sorry. We'll start at verse 1. Okay, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, uh, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, uh, fierce despisers of those that are good, uh, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, uh, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never, uh, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith, uh, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs, speaking of Janus and Jambres, uh, was also, or also was. Uh, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purity, uh, or excuse me, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium, at Lystra, uh, were persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, and yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus uh, shall suffer persecution. Okay, so this morning, uh, this was one of the suggested Sunday school series that um, when, when we had that little brainstorm session a while back that somebody had uh, suggested we do, uh, and how to deal with persecution, how to deal with persecution. Uh, the Bible actually has a lot to say uh, uh, concerning persecution. Uh, there's 62 instances where the word or a form of the word is used uh, within Scripture between Old and New Testament. <clears throat> so what is... Well, I need to adjust the... I thought it was going to be bigger than that. I'm sorry. Uh, what is persecution? What is persecution? So first thing we're going to do is we're going to define the words. Um, we see it, we find it in Scripture 62 times. And so as far as the Old Testament is concerned, uh, the word that you primarily see used is this one called radaf. And then the meaning is to, to be behind, to follow after, pursue, persecute, or uh, run after. Again, other variant of the word pursue, put the flight, chase. Uh, dog intended closely upon uh, to grasp, to follow, to aim, to secure. So the idea is basically like you're, you're chasing somebody, you're chasing somebody down, you're running hard after them. Uh, then you have a second word that's used. Well, I'm sorry. Here, the here within the within the King James, as far as same word, but translated a few different times. Uh, it would be pursue, persecute. Pursue, it's used 74 times. Persecute, used 20 times. Follow, 18. Chase, 13. Persecutor, 7. Pursuer, 6. And then follow after one, flight one, and then another three miscellaneous. Uh, this one's Murdaf, which is similar. Uh, and then the meaning for it is just simply just persecution. And one use we find in the uh, King James as far as persecuted. Then there's another one called Dalek, 
and then to burn the holly pursue it, we find that in actually uh, Psalm 10. And to inflame. But the idea is still there as far as uh, to to chase, to persecute, to follow after. Um, and then the inflammatory aspect of it is basically there's an aggression behind it. Then the New Testament words that you're going to find that we see, uh, dioko, and then that is the same concept, in, even though it's a foreign language, a different language uh, than Hebrew, but it still carries the same concept. It's to, uh, to make to run or to flee, to put to flight, uh, to drive away, uh, to run swiftly in order to catch a person or a thing. So the idea is that you're chasing after somebody really aggressively, and then they're, they're fleeing, they're running away. And then here are the usages of this word within uh, King James as far as persecutes 20, eight times, follow after six, follow four, suffer persecution three, and then there's another three miscellaneous usages of the word. Okay, so this is a variant of that same word uh, at Dioko. I'm sorry, we're in Second Timothy chapter. 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And that prefix, the EK in front of the same word, just means out of. So it's your, to drive out, to banish, to pursue. And then the last one that we have is diagmas. I know it seems a little boring, but, and that just simply means persecution. And the idea of persecution, again, is to cause a somebody to flee. Uh, it's a little different than being uh, suffering tribulation, but it's associated with that. So persecution is basically you're chasing after somebody, you're causing, causing them to flee. Okay, so with regard to persecution, here's our first definition, or here's what our first point is. What is, what is it? It's adversarial pursuit, adversarial pursuit. Um, we see this actually best exemplified in um, Christ's life in the Gospels, but as well as in Acts, in the book of Acts. Go to Acts. Acts. Um, chapter 6. Acts 6. Actually, I'm sorry, not Acts 6, but um, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8. Um, verse 1, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. This is, uh, we didn't read this, but Chapter 7 basically deals with Stephen whenever he was persecuted, he was killed, he was stoned, uh, following addressing the Sanhedrin. So uh, he had just been stoned, and then they, the, the men who stoned Stephen had laid their garments at the feet of Saul. And then so Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they speaking of the church, were all scattered abroad throughout all region, or throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And then the development carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And as for Saul, uh, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, uh, committing, committed them to prison. Uh, therefore, uh, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere uh, preaching the word. Okay, so we see the church is 
being aggressively pursued by this one individual by the name of Saul. We know later that in chapter 9 he's going to get saved, he's going to see Christ, and then once he gets saved, uh, he is going to, well, following his receiving sight, he's going to immediately start preaching Christ to those in the synagogue. And then he himself is going to be attacked and pursued by those that he accompanied with. I point. Um, but here, he pursued after believers, and the believers' response was to flee. So they went all abroad, everywhere, and then in addition to fleeing, they also preached the gospel. And, but Saul, it says here, he made havoc of the church, and then he entered into every house, hailing men and women, and then committed to prison. So it's adversarial pursuit. Adversarial pursuit. Thanks, man. In addition to adversarial wow. pursuit, it's a promise of God. We read that just in 2 Timothy, where we're told, uh, go to John 15 as well. Go to John 15. In 2 Timothy, Paul wrote to Timothy and told him, hey, that all that shall live Christ, uh, godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Okay, um, That's not an if, but they will. So if somebody is going to live close to Christ... They're going to be somebody that um, is going to experience his same um, uh, okay, so John 15, verse 17. Okay, these things I command you that you love one another. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. Uh, but because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If ye have, or excuse me, if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If ye have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Um, but all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. And if I had not uh, come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. Uh, he that hateth me hateth my father also. Uh, if I had not done among them the works which none other man did, uh, they had not had sin, but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. Uh, but this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Uh, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. And then verse 1 of 16. These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended, okay, or, or cause to stumble. So this is a promise. Uh, we'll see this actually reiterated a, a number of times in Scripture. Uh, I'm just using these two in particular that Christ promised, uh, and as well, he went uh, through Apostle Paul that persecution is to be expected for a believer. Uh, we don't see very much of it here in the U.S., and we actually have been very privileged for the most part, uh, at least within the last few generations. Actually, I'd say almost the last three generations that there hasn't been a lot uh, to experience. Um, I would say probably, actually even going back into the late 1800s, really. But the only time that I would venture to say that you might would have had persecution in the US within the last maybe 100 years or so would have uh, maybe during Prohibition when preachers were preaching against alcohol. And then, um, you know, you, well, at least from what little I've read with regard to that, when you, uh, in Texas, with J. Frank Norris and a number of other individuals that preach against, uh, well, not just alcohol, but other sin as well. And then they, they would be pursued by bootleggers or they, were, they would be attacked by bootleggers and that kind of thing. Uh, but by and large, generally overall, it's been pretty easy going for us here in the U.S. with regard to uh, physical persecution. Uh, 
No, it's not that they haven't had where um, uh, you could say, I guess, with, within the Obama administration that you've had where they weaponize the IRS to go after nonprofits and against churches and such, and then uh, other instances like that throughout. Yes, sir. I've seen a number of, of, of situations. Uh, Everett Sullivan and Lincoln, Nebraska had a church, and they padlocked his doors, wouldn't let, wouldn't, uh, let him operate the church. I've forgotten exactly what it was, but it was he was, took, a, took a Bible stand on something. Um, another one would be in Corpus Christi, would be, um, oh, what's the gentleman's name? I can't think now, the one guy that died in a plane crash, but he... Oh, uh, Lester Roloff. Yeah. He, he was, he, they uh, basically forced him to close his girl's home because he used corporal punishment on the girls, but okay. things like that. I think you can consider that persecution. Yeah, it that is, would be it is minor well. compared to what we see in the Bible, though. Yes, and, but it's still constituted. Mm -hmm. and you still have a force that's adversarial against well, One of the things that in for the gospel. This, this world is run by, pretty much by the God of this world, and if you read things like uh, Rules for Radicals, that it was a communist magazine written back in the 20s, or book written back in the 20s, it was dedicated to Lucifer. And if you look at Karl Marx, the number one theme is his hatred of God. And so we're seeing a world system uh, really changing towards socialism and towards, towards uh, Marxism, and we're, there's going to be more and more persecution with it, because Marxism is, is based on hatred of God. That's true. Wow. <laughs> And, we, and we'd also see it in places like Ethiopia, and, and you know, people are, are you know, Christians are just being rounded up and murdered there. So it's not, not so much in this country, but we see it in other places in the world. Yes. yes. They also took prayer out of the schools. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was another big factor as well. Any kind of influence that the Bible would have had in people's lives uh, outside of their home, that, that's, been, uh, that's been removed. So we have, as a promise of God, we will suffer persecution if we're living godly. If we're, now the thing is, we carry God's name, so people hate God. Uh, and, um, the, you know, they can't get to him. <laughs> but they can get to us who represent him. So that's, that's the reason that Christ gives us with regard to that. Uh, now it is possible that we can instigate persecution for our uh, bad disposition towards people who are supposed to actually love them. We'll get to the responses as far as how we're supposed to respond with regard to that. But it is promised, okay? It's an adversarial pursuit and it's a promise. Uh, it is a tool used to grow a believer. It is a tool used to grow a believer. And then it's a tool used to spread the gospel. So, um, tool used to grow a believer. Go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And then we'll also go to James, but 2 Corinthians. Uh, I'm sorry, chapter 1, chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll, we'll, we'll just start at verse 1. Um, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye also be of the consolation. Okay. Uh, we can read further with regard to how God delivered Paul and then also used it with him and then with the ministry there uh, in Asia and with others. But he gives 
pretty interesting here. It says that God allows that so that you would be able to console others. So one, you would be able to be consoled of God himself so that Christ would be able to console you, but you would, in turn, whenever you come across brethren that are in the same disposition, you would be able to comfort them. So God wants us to be a tool of comfort to believers that are in persecution. Now, ultimately, he's the one, and he's the one that gives grace, but um, we need to remember, we have to have a mindset that, okay, this is promised, this is to be expected. Uh, it, again, it's not pleasant. It's not anything uh, that, you know, is enjoyable necessarily. But there is grace to be received. Uh, there is uh, comfort to be received. And there is blessing to be received uh, as a result if we take it with the right disposition. Uh, go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Start at verse 1. It says, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Okay, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing, or lacking nothing, as is what that meaning. And if any of you lack wisdom, uh, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Okay, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, a double-minded mind. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Okay, so the patience to be, I, this could be as a standalone. You ask, patience, you ask wisdom of God, he's going to give it to you, but in particular, the context here is referencing back to if you are not patient, if you are enduring trouble and tribulation, uh, the trying of your faith, that you need wisdom from God. God, how I'll handle this. Now you ask him, he's going to give it to you. He's not going to upbraid you for it. Um, but we're told here, uh, let patience have her perfect work. Okay, knowing this, at the trying of your faith, work at patience. So God wants to develop in you patience. Sorry about that. I should turn my volume on. Um, so God uses tribulation. This is his repeat, in a sense, of Romans chapter 5. Go there real quick. Romans 5. Romans 5. Starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. Now, he's, speak, he's speaking of a particular grace, uh, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Wow, okay, that's another thing as far as a disposition that uh, we should have. Um, knowing that Tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and then hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Okay, so this, it's it's almost a repeat of uh, James. Um, you know, I can rejoice in tribulation. I can you know count it all joy when I fall into diverse temptation. Reason being that the trying of my faith is supposed to work patience. Now God's intended purpose with regard to that. Uh, is that I would have patience and ex patience experience and experience hope. Now, hope biblically is an expectation of something to come. That's it's a guarantee. It's going to happen. Uh, it's not necessarily how we think of it in um, American uh, English, as far as like it's something that I desire, but I'm not really certain if I'm going to get it or not. But rather, it is something that's guaranteed to pass, so I can you know take it to the bank, if you will. Uh, it's this is certain. Uh, it's it's going to happen. So we 
have hope because, well, it tells us here that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Now, how do we know that God's love is shown to us? You got somebody that's angry or bitter or that's in tribulation that's suffering, uh, you know, difficult hardship. Well, how is it that we know that oh, God loves me? It doesn't seem like it is because I have people attacking me, they're taking my money or, or whatever, I'm in physical danger for my life. Uh, fact is, Christ died for you. And that's that's where he points out here that uh, in due time that Christ died for the ungodly, uh, for when we are, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You know, for scarcely for a righteous man would one die yet per adventure. For a good man would some even dare to die, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God's love demonstrated towards us in that he sent his only begotten son to the cross so that we would have eternal life. Uh, that ultimately is how we know, okay, God loves me. There's other things as well, you know, uh, you can count as far as God's goodness towards you. Uh, earlier in the book of Romans, you know, God's goodness bring us, uh, bringeth us to repentance. He reigned upon the just and the unjust. And in fact, the matter is you can go through scripture and you read throughout from Genesis to Revelation that God is good. And he, he is because that, that's who he is. He can only do good because that's, that's who he is and what he is. But he uses persecution, tribulation, uh, difficulty, the hardships to grow us, to mature us, uh, to develop patience in us and also that we would be a tool to be able to comfort others. Um, but we need to, first off, have uh, a ready set to position that, okay, this is, you know, this is of God. In other words, I, if I don't have that wisdom, then I can ask God for <coughs> wisdom as far as being able to handle it. But ultimately, in fact, this, this is a promised thing. God said that, you know, if you're gonna live godly in Christ Jesus, you're gonna suffer persecution. If the world hated him, they're gonna hate you as well. Uh, so it's, it's, it's guaranteed as a Christian if you're going to live for Christ at some point uh, whether it be a small measure of your life or a large measure of it um, we will we will suffer uh, persecution okay we will suffer uh, go to Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 actually Hebrews 6 first and then we'll go to Hebrews 12 Hebrews 6 Hebrews 6, uh, starting at verse 9. Okay, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. He had just given him a warning. Uh, we skipped that part, but he had given him a warning as far as that, hey, if you don't grow, you don't mature, you're nigh unto burning. In other words, you're, you're, the God's chastisement coming upon you. Um, and then, uh, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Okay, we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, uh, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Okay, for when God had made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless thee. And multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained a promise. Okay, for men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Okay, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, being his, his character and in his word, uh, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope or the expectation which is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, with the forerunners for us entered, even Jesus being in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so that, that's a lengthy passage, and it goes into a lot of things. Um, but he mentions a few things here. Um, now, all right, quick quiz. All right. The writer was writing to Hebrew believers. Now, what was his purpose in writing to them? When he wrote him this letter? 
turn them back to Christ from Judaism. And they, yeah, why were they turning? Persecution. Yes, okay, perfect. Um, yeah, they were being ostracized not only just for being Jewish, but as well as from their own uh, <coughs> brethren according to the flesh because they were believers in Christ. So they were being thought of as, okay, oh, you're abandoning Judaism. So uh, losing probably opportunity as far as being able to work, probably a place to live, even their life in a lot of instances. And so they said, well, easier on us at the very least with dealing with our brother, not necessarily with the Romans, because you can't really do anything about being Jewish, but at least with the Jewish brethren, if we just go back into Judaism. And so the writer was admonishing them, hey, look, you are turning to the weak and beggarly element. In other words, you are going back to something that has really no value or no worth because Christ is better than. And that's his argument that he presents throughout the whole book. And he has an underlying theme that he mentions to them throughout, but it's you see this here stand out, is that you need faith and patience. In other words, you need to exercise faith and patience. Uh, you need to grow, you need to mature, you need to move forward for Christ, you need to, uh, chapter 13 he talks about, go go to Christ without the camp. You know, as Christ was um, crucified outside the camp, and so you need to go identify with him. And you need to exercise faith and patience. And that's how you receive promise, is through faith and patience. So exercising faith and patience. And God has given us actually something by which, you know, we can be encouraged, and that is His Word. And he said, by two immutable things, you know, God made a promise, and that was His Word, and then His character. Now, His Word is founded on His character, so in other words, what He says is founded on His ability to back up what He says. And so when God gave promise on something, uh, He could swear by no greater, and so the fact was, He's able to perform what He said He would. And so when God gives promises, like, hey, it's a guarantee. And so I can, I can rest assured, hey, I, you know, with regard to God's promises. So he says, I need to exercise faith and patience. Now in chapter 11, or excuse me, chapter 12, chapter 12, um, Starting in verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing ye are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and then let us run with patience uh, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, okay, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction or such opposition of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Can ye not he have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So he's admonishing here, keep going forward, keep going on for God, and run your race with patience. Uh, reason why is Christ didn't quit, so you shouldn't quit either. Um, but you do so looking unto Jesus and considering him, uh, as it says in verse 3. The reason why is because you want to get discouraged at the fact that you look at your circumstances, uh, you look at, well, you can even look at your own resources, your own ability. The fact is, we are nothing. We, I can't do anything without Christ. Uh, he even said so much as far as in John 15, you know, I'm the vine, uh, he's the branch. And so I, I, um, I draw my sustenance, it's going to be from him, so I need, I need to look to him. Uh, in order for me to be able to keep on and not quit. And then he goes on and, um, well, verse 5, okay, and you have not, or you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Okay, now that seems kind of odd, right? <laughs> but the fact is, that's, um, that's God's plan. So he allows this as a means for us to be able to grow. It's child training. Uh, the scourging and the chastening isn't just simply like, okay, whacking some kid because they've been bad, but it's, all, it's, it's as much coaching. It's as much, okay, hey, uh, we're told in Second Timothy to endure hardness as a soldier, a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And so that is an aspect of the Christian life uh, we don't really relish or we don't look towards as being, okay, this is a positive thing, but it is. 
uh, it's promised, and God uses it as a tool, as, excuse me, as a tool to be able to grow us. And then finally, it's a tool to spread the gospel. It's a tool to spread the gospel. We'll go back to Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8. Starting in verse 1, Acts 8, verse 1. Okay, and Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Okay, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Uh, as for Saul, he was havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere uh, preaching the word. They went everywhere preaching the word. Uh, we can go through basically almost every chapter following this, and we'll see examples that they went up as far as Antioch, uh, Pisidia, and then you had their believers that were Jewish, but they were from Cyprus that had preached to the Gentiles, because up to this point they were only going to other Jewish individuals. So they'd find a, uh, an area to flee to, and then whenever they'd find an area that they were, okay, they felt, okay, this is a safe place to go, uh, they'd go to the synagogues, and then they'd be preaching to Jews only, or exclusively, basically addressing Jews. But uh, when they got up as far as into Antioch, they started dealing with the Gentiles, and they started going after, they, they did just consider, they weren't discriminatory as far as to who they were going to preach the gospel to. They were just sharing it with them. People started getting saved, and then all of a sudden, okay, Barnabas hears of it, he comes up, and then he goes forward to seek Saul. Um, and his heart was greatly encouraged with regard to that. And we see, okay, the gospel spread. But it was a tool meant to spread the gospel. <coughs> now, a lot of people, are, I'm sure, a lot of us have heard preaching with regard to, uh, and it might be, I, I really don't know, this is conjecture on my, um, I would assume probably in most people's part would bring this up, that because Christ had told them that you're supposed to go into Judea, uh, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts, and to Jer and all Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world, being witnesses unto him. And we only see uh, within these first eight chapters that they were within Jerusalem, and they didn't really spread abroad beyond that. Um, but then you got persecution hit, and then now everybody starts spreading out. Um, that might have been the case. Um, it's a good point, but I don't, you know, I, I can't necessarily say, okay, uh, dogmatically or hardly, okay, that was the reasoning behind it. But I do know that God used it as a means to be able to spread the gospel. Now, how many of us would... Um, I am myself included with regard to that. You're suffering persecution, so your response is going to be, "Hey, I'm going to flee because I want to. <laughs> I want to live. I'm not looking to to die earlier than what I want to die, unless it's you know God's will for me to for that to be the case uh, with regard to dying within a uh, being persecuted." But um, how many of us, when we flee, would be preaching the gospel? Well, these believers, they did. As they went everywhere, uh, they went everywhere, um, and they preached the gospel. And so God used it as a tool for the spreading of the gospel. Um, it's not always bad, necessarily, uh, even though immediately you have a lot of damage, a lot of hurt that takes place with regard to that. But God uses that to win people to himself, and he uses that for the greater good of the spread of the gospel and his name being glorified um, as far as persecution. I am out of time with regard to addressing our personal responses to this and we'll see that next week as far as we'll pretty much spend the, the bulk of the time just dealing with okay how should we respond. Um, just addressing as introductory okay these are God's or at least these are the, the, the things that I've seen with regard to what we see in scripture that when persecution takes place, uh, what is it? And 
what, 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 what constitutes persecution and also um, what, what God's intent purpose for it was. Uh, does anybody have any questions? <clears throat> no questions? All right, so next week we'll be looking at believer's response to it, believer's response to persecution, what it should be. Okay. No questions, we're dismissed.